Episode 4, August the 4th to 8th, 1914, at the 11th hour, by Michael McDonough, Parliamentary Correspondent of the Times in 1914, read by Clive Harfield. The writer, who is the author of many outstanding books, was, when war broke out, representing a great national newspaper in the press gallery of the House of Commons. He was a spectator, with unique opportunities, of the moving scene during the first momentous days of tense excitement in London. It was in the streets on August the 4th, 1914, after the House of Commons had adjourned, that I found myself in an atmosphere of real passion Parliament Street and Whitehall were thronged with people highly excited and rather boisterous. A brilliant sun shone in a cloudless sky. Young men in straw hats were in the majority. Girls in light calico dresses were numerous. All were already touched with the war fever. They regarded their country as a crusader, redressing all wrongs and bringing freedom to oppressed nations. Cries of, down with Germany, were raised. Germany was the aggressor. She must be made to ask humbly for peace. The singing of patriotic songs such as Rule Britannia, the Red, White and Blue, and also the Marseillaise, brought the crowds still closer together in national companionship. They saw England radiant through the centuries, valiant and invincible, and felt assured that so she shall appear forever. There were opponents, of course. Making my way through the crowds to Trafalgar Square, I found two rival demonstrations in progress under Nelson's pillar. On one side of the plinth, for war, and on the other, against. The rival crowds glared at each other. Cries of, the war does not concern us, we must keep out of it, were answered with cries of, down with Germany, the violator of Belgium. I looked up at the effigy of Nelson, sailing the sky with one arm and one eye, to see whether, in imagination, I could notice any change in his attitude. But no, he was still gazing steadily towards France, the enemy, as he had been placed on his pillar 80 years ago. Suddenly, amidst the cheering and booing, a cry was raised. The king, the king, on to Buckingham Palace! and at once we streamed out of Trafalgar Square into the Mall and out of Whitehall into Birdcage Walk, both ways leading to the palace. I saw Asquith escorted and cheered a little while before as he drove in his motor car from the House of Commons to Downing Street. But it is the King and not the Prime Minister that is preeminently the representative of the nation. It is the King and not the Prime Minister that is the centre of people's thought and vision at a time of national festivity or emergency. At Buckingham Palace, the crowd sang God Save the King with tremendous fervour. His Majesty came out onto the balcony overlooking the forecourt, wearing the uniform of an Admiral of the Fleet. He was joined by the Queen, the Prince of Wales and Princess Mary. The crowd greeted the King by singing with cheerful boisterousness that homely British song, for he's a jolly good fellow. It conveyed to monarch and subjects the authentic thrill of comradeship. His Majesty was not only the best of kings, he was also of good fellows the best. He had to appear on the balcony three separate times during the evening because of the chanting of the crowd, slowly and with emphasis, betokening that they would have no refusal. We want our king. His Majesty smiled and bowed, bowed and smiled, and the throng sang to him that he was a jolly good fellow, again, again, and again. At the approach of the decisive hour of eleven, midnight German time, when the ultimatum to Germany was to expire, we returned in our thousands to Whitehall. Downing Street was as packed as it well could be. At number 10, the Prime Minister's house, were gathered leading members of the government. While we waited, there was an incessant coming and going of callers. 
but no answer had come from Germany. From the clock tower of the Houses of Parliament came the light and gladsome chimes of the Four Quarters, which are set to the words, All through this hour, Lord be my guide, and by thy power no foot shall slide. Then followed the slow and measured strokes of Big Ben proclaiming to London that it was eleven o'clock. We listened in silence. Perhaps it was but a reaction to the mood we are in, but I thought Big Ben was tolling the hour with an even more solemn note, for the pause between each stroke and its reverberation seemed unusually prolonged. Was he booming out the true and in the false? Was he booming out sweet peace and in red slaughter? At the eleventh stroke of the clock, the crowd swarming in Downing Street, Parliament Street and Parliament Square burst with one accord into God Save the King. No one came out of 10 Downing Street. No statement was made. There was no public proclamation that we were at war by a herald to the sound of trumpets and the beating of drums. The great crowd rapidly dispersed in all directions most of them running to get home quickly. And as they ran, they cried aloud rather hysterically, War! 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 They were eager, no doubt, to spread the dread news in their family circles. Thus our entry into the Great War was announced by Big Ben, tolling the hour of eleven. And we had been brought into it by the challenge of a broken treaty. August the 5th. Wednesday. Britain at war! So London is informed this morning in bold black letters on the placard of the Times. In the House of Commons today, Asquith made officially the inevitable announcement. Since 11 o'clock last night, a state of war has existed between Germany and this country. The die is cast. The House, again crowded to excess, received the news in silence. Emotions were battened down as are the hatches of a ship when a storm arises. Again, it struck me as extraordinary that the House of Commons, the representative assembly of the people, has not been definitely asked by a question put from the chair whether it was for war or against it. This enormous power is vested in the Crown, and exercised by the dozen or so men forming the Cabinet, independently of parliamentary authority and control in the first instance. Of course, their action is reinforced and confirmed indirectly by Parliament. When Asquith went on to say, We propose to ask the House for a credit of £100 million, members burst into a terrific roar of applause, as much as to say, We're ready! The speech of the Prime Minister was magnificent for its affecting strain of persuasiveness in England's vindication. It will rank among the historic parliamentary orations. There could be no greater contrast in personality, looks, manner and speech than that presented by the two statesmen who were leading the country into war. The rugged and unshapely Asquith and Grey, graven to a perfection of form. No nation, said Asquith, in that deep voice of his, tremulous and vibrant, has ever entered into a great struggle, and this is one of the greatest in history, with a clearer conscience and a stronger conviction that it is fighting not for aggression or the advancement of its own interests, but for principles whose maintenance is vital to the civilised world. The doubts and misgivings of the past two days were at rest. The House had braced itself for the ordeal that lay before us. Lloyd George, Chancellor of the Exchequer, told the House that in order that the gold coinage might be withdrawn from circulation and used as a munition of war, the government had decided to issue treasury notes of 20 shillings and 10 shillings value, respectively. Three millions by Friday and afterwards at the rate of five millions a day until the supply was deemed sufficient. 
Lloyd George produced from his pocket one of the pound notes, and as he handed it across the table to Arthur Balfour, I heard him remark, It's not a very pretty picture. It is a first proof. I waited in the reporter's gallery while the members dispersed to the ancient cry of the doorkeeper, Who goes home? Mr. Speaker Lowther, in a wig and gown, stepped down from his high and canopied chair and stood by its side, waiting until the sergeant's arms came up the floor from his place by the main door and, lifting the mace from the table, preceded him from the chamber by the door immediately behind his chair. Members departed by the main door under the clock at the far end, not joking and laughing as is usually their way when a sitting is over, but in a low-voiced and restrained mood. I've often looked down on the empty chamber and thought nothing of it. But on this occasion, I felt as if I were having a strange experience. Events, perhaps the most fateful in the country's history, have taken place here during the last three days, and it seemed to me proper that the House should give some sign of having retained a consciousness of their significance. But no. From the oak-panelled walls came no vibration of the tremendous utterance of the three days, the Prime Minister's voice declaring that an ultimatum had been sent to Germany. Not even the sound of the closing of a door was heard, often the most tragic thing in life. There was only silence and emptiness. Things had begun to crumble about us, we who thought till the beginning of this week that we were rooted firmly in a peaceful and secure existence. A rush for food set in. Before going to the House of Commons on this day, I visited at the two principal stores, Army and Navy and Civil Service, and found them both, like all the provision shops I passed in walking from Clapham, thronged with buyers. Those at the stores were principally women of the middle class, looking well-dressed and comfortably off. All of them had what appeared to be abnormally long lists of groceries. I confess I had my own little list. Are we not told that the first law of nature is self-preservation? That is the first reaction to a situation of danger. It is supposed that the pinch of war will first be felt in the scarcity of food. Fill the cupboard! accordingly, was the order of the day. Every counterhand at the civil service store in the Strand had a long line of customers waiting to be served. I joined one of them, but after two hours' wait, I was still a good way from the counter and had to leave unserved for the House of Commons. Notices were put up at the store that the execution of orders was uncertain. Several provision shops at Clapham were so speedily sold out that they closed in the early afternoon. So far, there had only been a slight rise in prices, but price was only a secondary consideration. What people wanted was the food, and some were willing to pay any price for it. Hoarding was general, more or less. I hear of people who, taking the situation at the hop, had already packed their cupboards with provisions. The first appeal for recruits appeared on the walls of London on August the 6th. It was printed in the national colours. Within a deep red border, in vivid blue letters on a white ground, were the words, Your king and country need you. You being heavily underscored. In this crisis, the poster said, our country calls on all her young unmarried men to rally round the flag and enlist in the ranks of the army ages 18 to 30 years. Another poster was headed, A Call to Arms, and said, An addition of 100,000 men to His Majesty's regular army is immediately necessary in the present grave national emergency. Lord Kitchener, who had been appointed Secretary of State for War, was confident that this appeal will be at once responded to by all those who have the safety of our empire at heart. Thus, the young men in straw hats, who were clamouring for war in Whitehall early in the week, were now afforded the opportunity of demonstrating their patriotism in more practical form. Their response was immediate. The recruiting headquarters was in Old Scotland Yard off Whitehall. As I passed there that evening, I saw a big throng of young men, still in straw hats, waiting their turn to get in and, 
in the old phrase, take the king's shilling. From the press gallery of the House of Commons on August the 7th, I witnessed a remarkable incident of the celerity with which that supposed slow coach, Parliament, can be made to move in a crisis. The Defence of the Realm Act, an emergency war measure, was passed through all its stages in five minutes. Reginald McKenna, Home Secretary, who had charge of the bill, did not even have it printed. All he had was a brief draft in writing of some of its provisions. He began by asking leave to bring in a bill to make regulations during the present war for the defence of the realm. The regulations would provide safeguards against spying and sabotage, seeking information to assist the enemy, tapping wires, showing signal lights, blowing up bridges or docks. The bill also empowered the government to come to sweeping decisions and take swift action in prosecuting the war. By August the 8th, Saturday, an angry outcry was raging against the hoarding of food. In the suburbs, women loaded with parcels were stopped by other women and roughly deprived of their commodities. Delivery vans at the provision stores were held up by men and their contents rifled. The government said there was no lack of food. Maximum retail prices were fixed. As an example to all, it was announced that, by the order of the King and Queen, plain, simple fare was to be the only daily rule at the royal table. Looking back on the week, I had a sense of having seen a page of history in the making. Perhaps a red letter page. Brother Bert, 